Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Rutgers School of Public Health, for the opportunity to share about my work with urban adolescent girls of color, and specifically urban adolescent black girls. It's an honor to be here to share about hair as a social determinant of health among urban uh, black African American women and adolescent girls in the United States. Well, before we get started, I wanted to actually share a little bit about the road to hair as a social determinant of health and what brought me on this road. Well, I actually started off in global health. That is my background. I was very fortunate to be on a medical mission early, right after college. I lived in Africa, actually sub-Saharan Africa, in South Africa for about 10 years. And during that time, I was exposed to many experiences but mostly to the lives of orphans and also caregivers um, that were caring for children affected by HIV and AIDS. And I stayed there for many years. Coming back to America, I was hit with the obesity epidemic. I think it's one thing when you live in a city or community or even a suburb and you're surrounded by um, the challenges of what it means to be in there as well as the beauty. But then when you are away from that community, and you come back to that community, it was a shock for me. And um, being from New York City and seeing the young children and that were uh, larger than myself and teenage girls that were um, not able to keep up with activities, day-to-day -day activities, it was a challenge for me. And it was really sad to see what had become of my childhood um, home in Brooklyn, New York. And so in response to that, I actually created a curriculum and at the time, I was in Boston, Massachusetts. And this curriculum was called Move It and Groove It. It was used by the Boston Public Schools and several schools, and also after school programs, um, community programs. It was used in the Milton School District, in private schools and public schools. And it spread to about 25 schools. And I think at one point, I was invited to uh, one of the Boston Public Schools. And I was able to really see firsthand some of the challenges of some of the urban school districts. Well, as you know, many years ago, these school buildings were not built to accommodate um, the overcrowding that we sometimes have in, in, in public schools. And so even the gym spaces and workspaces were uh, compromised. And so children did not have enough places to play. And this is very common in uh, urban centers, especially now as we see this global trend of families and um, young people and millennials moving to the urban centers. And so it's a challenge for us in urban areas to really carve out um, spaces for walking, for physical activity, for bike lanes, and to enjoy life outside. But this was uh, 2007, right around the time that uh, Michelle Obama started with her Let's Move campaign, and wellness was not necessarily a common word. And so um, over time, it really caught on. And I think and it, we still have a ways to go in terms of blending the, the urban environment with urban health, which is my focus. And so one of the things I, I came across, especially then I became an educator in New York City Department of Education, which is the largest public school system. And I was very fortunate to work in a public school in Brooklyn. And I really observed some of the same things as I traveled to different schools in New Jersey and there in Massachusetts. Some of the trends that I saw was Boys playing in physical education class, usually playing basketball, very active, moving up and down. And I would see some girls sitting on the bleachers, sitting and talking. And this was not something that I saw in every school, in every situation, but it became a consistent trend. And I sat with the girls, and I would talk to them and ask them, well, why are you sitting? Why are you not playing with the boys? And I would hear different reasons and, and different scenarios. But one common thread that I heard throughout talking to girls, whether it was in New York City or Boston or Newark, New Jersey, was their hair. Yes, their hair. And I know that when I started talking about hair as a social determinant of health, I got right quite a few questions. People were confused. They didn't understand, how does this connect with health? And why is this such a big deal? And this is an opportunity for all of us to understand. And so in many cases, um, the, the situation that I came across was girls, really, the time, money, and effort 
involved in hair. And I think this is true for women and girls of, of every race and every walk of life and every ethnicity. The way we look and the way we present ourselves, but particularly for young girls and for adolescents, especially during the stage of self-identity. Um, you know, we know during our adolescent stages, self-identity is one of the stages of development. And so that's a time when adolescents, boys and girls, are inquiring about themselves and trying to understand who am I and what is going on and what do I stand for and, and who will I be? And so who we are and developing our identity is a big deal at that time. And so hair, it becomes a part of our bodies and it becomes a part of our self-expression to the world. And in many cases, our hair has become a reason for not being involved in physical activity. We see this in the literature. It is small, but it is growing, but it is less um, evident with adolescent girls. And so I'm hoping that today, whether you're a public health professional, whether you're a fellow educator, a school nurse, or um, even someone involved in the health department, or even a parent or an advocate of young girls of color, I'm hoping that you'll walk away from this webinar with some tools for your toolbox to be able to encourage and inspire and motivate young girls of, of color, of African descent, to be physically active. Because as we know, this is a, a group that we have that is disproportionately affected, more so than other groups, by overweight and obesity, and putting them at risk for what I call um, co-conspirators, which are chronic disorders such as blood, high blood pressure, cardiovascular disease, and diabetes. So let us begin. Okay, so here is what we do know about adolescent obesity. What we know is that overall, there is a decline in adolescent obesity, and this is great news. Uh, right now, we're at 13.9% based on the Youth Risk Behavior Survey of 2016. However, there's still a disparity that remains. And when you look closely at different subgroups and different uh, populations, you'll find this disparity, particularly among black high school students and more so among black adolescent females. And I'll just say right now that if, you, uh, if anyone has an experience that they would like to share or a uh, question, feel free to just type it and share it in the chat box and take a minute and share it because um, this is something I know that is sort of new to some. To some it is not, but to some there might be some, some questions and so I welcome those questions. We welcome those questions. And so even though overall in the United States um, obesity is on the decline among young, young people, it's not, that's not true for every group. What else do we know? Who is really at risk? And so here we have the percentage of high school students who were overweight. Now this came out again in the Youth Risk Behavior Survey for 2016, looking at the data from 2015, who were overweight and who had obesity based by, uh, by sex, race, and ethnicity. And as we see, what is highlighted here is that definitely obesity exists among all races and ethnicities. However, it is more pronounced among black females for overweight and also for females um, that are black, that are obese as well. 15.2% and overweight, 21.2%. And again, this is a concern because we know that this puts them at risk for other chronic disorders. Now, when it comes to physical activity, what else do we know? We know that it's nationally recommended for young people and adults to participate in at least 60 minutes of physical activity. And we know that this is not happening. Again, using the Youth Risk Behavior Survey and data from the CDC, we see that in 2013, only 16% of black females were uh, reported to be physically active for 60 minutes a day. And the most recent data looking at 2015, reported from the Youth Risk Behavior Survey of 2016, we find that again, only 16.6% of black females are being physically active. And also now we also see this is true for um, Hispanic young girls as well. And this is a concern, as I shared, because the data is showing that these, this, these populations are at risk and more at risk than their racial and ethnic counterparts. 
This is something that we may not know that we are now starting to know, that yes, hair has something to do with it. As I shared before, when I sat with girls on the bleachers trying to find out, well, why aren't you active and why aren't you joining the boys and why aren't you involved, one common thread came through. It was their hair. The time and the effort and the money it takes to get their hair a certain way actually is reverted because of water in all of its forms, but specifically sweat and perspiration. Now, we know that this is true among even my white colleagues and friends and my Asian colleagues and friends, that once you've put your hair together, there is a lack of energy to go out now and then to be active. But the, the difference is that among black women, there is a special significance and meaning to the hair for women and girls, not for all of them, but for some. And this has become evident in the literature. We have some growing uh, in the literature. However, it's more pronounced in the gray literature and blogs and blogs. All you have to do is Google uh, black hair and you'll find hundreds of YouTube videos, lots of data that's there on this topic of hair, how it impedes and shapes the physical activity of African uh, women of African descent and now girls of African descent. This is a concern because when we have a group that's already disproportionately affected by obesity and overweight, we really have to examine what are the barriers. And these barriers may not be seen or easily observed. And so quantitative and qualitative research is necessary to unearth some of the data there and to explore some of the reasons for how hair shapes physical activity in this population. And so we have one uh, study here from Hall and, and, and colleagues in 2013. They developed a 40-item survey, and they surveyed 103 women of African descent. And some of the results they found was that the 50% of the women reported that they had to change their hairstyle just in order to exercise. That's about half the women. Also, almost half avoided exercise and also reported that they were less likely to exercise 150 minutes per week, which is only about two hours per week. And so again, if we have a population that is disproportionately affected by overweight and obesity, we really need to start to break down and explore some of the reasons why. And it will take interventions, policy, and continued research. Another study by Gathers and Men actually shared similar data, a survey on hair loss and hair care with a larger sub, uh, sample size of 200 women. And uh, this was a church-related uh, survey. What they found was, like Hall's uh, data, 45% of these women also avoided exercise because of hair concerns. And this, again, was in 2014. And about 22% said that it impeded they're maintaining a healthy body weight. And some reasons for that was because once your hair is disrupted, then there's this process, time and effort, and of course money and resources to get it back to that original style. But the part that I think was most concerning for me was that 32% of their, their sample felt that the, the provider did not understand African American hair and the, the meaning and significance behind it. And this is a concern that I'm actually speaking to now, the providers, the nurses, the school nurses. Um, this is something where we need to reach out and learn more and increase our skills in terms of a cultural competency because at times we may not be able to understand some of the challenges. And as I shared before, this may be uh, unfamiliar to some. And I see here that we, we have a question, a comment actually. Um, this this, this comment says, that is absolutely correct. I wore my hair locked for over 15 years, which worked for me in regards to my exercise um, regimen. And so again, for some, this is not breaking news. But in the literature, this is important that we continue to research. Those of you that are in this space of hair and body and health and physical activity and obesity prevention, it's very important that we uh, continue to explore this because this is becoming a reason for some black women and girls now 
to not exercise and to not be physically active. And we know that there are so many benefits that come from physical activity that we really need to explore this because as we looked at the data, this population is one of the top that are at risk. And continue to ask questions, just type it away in the chat box. Another research um, uh, journal article we found from Hubshin and um, colleagues in 2016, more recent, surveyed five, 51 uh, women of African descent and also had focus groups. And some of the results was very much in line with some of the other data that we're exploring today. And what they found was that several of their population felt that a, a salient theme, I should say, was that they were not going to sweat out their hairstyle, that they were choosing their hair over their health. And this is something that is, again, concerning. And it, has, ha, it does have a um, potential to shape health outcomes because we know that vigorous physical activity involves sweating and perspiration. Cardiovascular exercise involves sweating. Um, fat burning exercise involves sweating. And so if we have a, a population that is refusing to sweat because of the hairstyle, we must explore why this is. And we also, those of us that are exercising and are physically active, we need to uh, find ways of motivating and, and also being an example in our families and our communities because this is actually affecting many, many women and girls of color. This was a research article that I was actually a part of as well. Based, this is based on my research that I've been building upon. Hair as a barrier to physical activity among African American girls. Now this was a project that was done at a high school, and we, we, we spoke with 50 girls that are of African descent, and we actually created a survey. I had to create uh, an instrument along with my colleague, and the reason was because we could not find an instrument that would explore physical activity, obesity, and hair, hair, cultural hair practices. And so we were able to create our own instrument and one of the things we found was that there was an association between obesity and the time of day that girls participated in physical education class. We also found an association between girls who had a high BMI and those girls that had spent more time on their hair. Um, as we know, it is expensive for anyone to get their hair done and also it takes Time. And so we found that time and money were, were associated with a decrease in physical activity. And so if you really think about it, it makes sense. If you spend a lot of money and you spend a lot of time, and when I say money, I'm thinking these are high school girls. On average, 30, 40, up to $200 is spent on hair care, not to mention products, accessories, and the like. And then now to participate in physical activity, which then would revert the hairstyle. That is a loss of time, that is a loss of money, and that is a loss of effort. And so some girls choose to just not participate in physical activity. And this is an area that we have to address. I think as, as educators, speaking to educators and those that are community activists, parents, to really encourage young girls to be physically active. This is an important uh, critical element and it's very important as well for them to understand at the end of the day it's really not about the outward appearance, it's about your character and it's about really building them up in a way that they can really be productive in society and contribute the areas of their lives to society and to their families and their communities. But right now this is an area of concern. Um, I have a comment here and keep the comments coming. It says, I worked with foster parents for many years. We offered education around hair and skin care for children of color. It was our most popular class, mostly because professionals lacked knowledge on the topic. And we have never even considered physical activity issues. So much important information here. Thank you for that. I agree that this is an area of importance. And again, speaking to researchers, um, educators, daycare providers, and, um, and especially educators of, of children, 
this is an area uh, that we should really consider through policy of making hair education a part of perhaps a health education module in schools. So here's some results from the research of hair as a barrier to uh, physical activity and connection to obesity. And as you can see, we found a significant associations between the amount of time that was spent on hair and being overweight and obese. And also, the amount, the time of day that the gym class was offered. And so, I want to take a minute to just unpack this a minute. If you have physical, physical education class in the morning, girls who took physical education class or gym in the morning were more likely to be obese than girls who had physical education class at the end of the day. Why is that? Because if you have, if you come to school and you're put together, and you come to school and you have gym first period, you're not going to go out and then get excited and get active and sweat and participate in physical activity. Why? Your school may not have access to showers. Your school may not allow enough time after physical education class to refresh and get yourself back together to go and continue the class for the rest of the day. So we found that girls who had gym class towards the end of the day were less obese because after gym, they can go home. They can go home, they can shower, they can change, they can wash their hair. But the idea of spending the day with sweat, with sweaty hair, was uh, more of a, a reason to avoid physical activity altogether. So again, speaking to uh, policy makers and educators, principals, this might be an area of concern. Maybe uh, pursuing an idea that was actually suggested to me by some of the, the girls in, in my research, perhaps having them choose the time of day that gym is offered might be an area to get around this and helping the girls to be more physically active. Perhaps choosing other physical activities that have great physical benefits but may not be uh, ones that induce sweat might be another option such as starting walking groups or mind-body exercises, or strength training exercises that we'll explore later in our, in our um, implications. So going back to what we now know, uh, going back to hair, a strand is not just a strand. I know that visually all hair looks the same, but biologically it's actually different, and that's based on the follicle. Now the follicle are tube-like pockets in the scalp of the hair. And an average head might have about hundreds of thousands of follicles. And it's the shape of the follicle that actually determines the texture of hair. And we find that straight hair, they come out of follicles that have a circular round shape. And we find that hair that is kinky or coily, the follicles are actually flat and have a more of an elliptical oval shape. And so even though all hair, regardless of your racist ethnicity, looks the same, a strand is not just a strand. Looking closer, we find that just using um, African, Asian, and Caucasian, the three uh, dominant uh, most popular uh, groups, we can see that the shape of the follicle is different. For Asian hair, it's a round-shaped follicle. And we find that for Caucasian hair, it is an oval-shaped follicle. However, for African hair, it is flat and also oval. And so that type of a shape of a follicle produces hair that is wavy and curly. Some of the challenges for having uh, wavy, uh, curly, or kinky curly hair, the hair grows out of the follicle in such an abundance of a curl pattern that it actually curls on itself. And that can result in a head full of curls. And we've all, most of us are, can uh, identify or recall an afro. It's just a bundle of curls that are curling upon itself. Sometimes it can be a challenge because some men of color actually struggle with, with razor bumps. And what happens is the curl is curling on itself, but it's curling inside of the skin. And so that is the, the extent to which how curly the abundance of, of hair that comes from the uh, flat and oval-shaped 
follicle is. Another challenge is that because the follicle has a very flat and oval shape and the hair has several curls that curl on itself, the natural oil in the hair, it's called sebum, is unable to evenly distribute across each strand. And because of that, hair from uh, African, uh, Afri those of African descent, the hair sometimes is drier and more fragile because the sebum is unable to evenly distribute among all the strands because of the curl pattern. I tend to explain this by um, using an example of an icicle, especially this time of year. When an icicle uh, is shaped, pointed going down, and it starts to melt, we can see the water dripping straight down. You can imagine that to be one hair strand of a Caucasian or Asian hair strand. The, let's say the sebum, the oil, is able to coat that hair strand completely. Whereas with the hair strand that comes from a flat and oval shaped um, follicle of that of African hair, it's unable to clearly equally distribute the sebum, the natural hair oils. And so as a result, many hair products for uh, women of color or women of African descent, not necessarily uh, black women, but even um, those that are biracial descent or even uh, Afro-Cuban, Brazilian, Dominican, anyone of African descent, there is a tendency to have the hair tends to be more drier than other hair textures. That is a concern because you find that these hair products for um, hair, African hair, will have more oil. And so that is, that is something that's directly connected to the difference, the biological difference in hair follicles. Uh, I do have another comment here. The Surgeon General, yes, this was actually uh, in one of the research uh, articles that I wrote that uh, the Surgeon General, Regina Benjamin, has commented on this topic that uh, hair hairstyles, actually many women are choosing their hairstyle over their decision to, to participate in physical activity. And um, because of that, it's become a very common reason for women to not participate. So as I was exploring some of the reasons for this. Why is this? I actually was able to develop through the conducting my research, I was able to conduct a framework for understanding the background behind hair and the significance and all that comes to the table when we look at hair and how it shapes the health of African um, American women and girls. And they're very there's several factors, historical factors, social, environmental, and what I consider media. So this is a sociocultural construct of what I call ideal hair. Ideal hair is hair that is uh, in, in the minds of some uh, women of African descent, it is the, the epitome, the, uh, the object of the goal, I should say, or the bar of how hair should be. And really there are several reasons for or influences for this. The idea is that that is the goal, is to have this type of hair, this hairstyle, or maybe hair care. And not even that it's a desire, but it is a need because of the difference in the follicles and the maintenance that's involved. Put quite simply, when I personally work out, uh, I'm, and let's say I work out with a colleague, that, that my Caucasian colleagues or my white colleagues, I don't have wash and wear hair. We can exercise and sweat and it might be able, they might be able to quickly wash out their hair. That for me now would take time. I would need to find my hair products and so on. And so for some women and girls, this, is, this can be considered a challenge. But there are other influences that are involved with hair and how it shapes our decisions to, to have our hair in a certain way that I call a sociocultural cultural construct. And the first one I want to unpack is historical influences. What does this include? Now, before, uh, in, in ancient Africa, hair had special significance and actually could represent your social status. It could represent your tribe. It could represent your age, um, whether you were royalty. A hairstyle was much more than just a hair covering. 
And so we find that through the years, the hair of um, those of African descent has changed to where we are today. Now then going on to slavery, as we look at the historical, that dimension there, um, we find that when uh, Africans were brought over during that time, many of them had experienced uh, the cutting of the hairstyle. And so because hair actually symbolized their tribe or their social status in, in their community, in their country, by cutting, um, having that cut off, not by their choosing, but being forced to have their hair cut off or having it cut off for them, actually separated them from their original tribes and was able to divide those that were there. And so you find that during slavery, the same is true. Going on further, historically, there was this desire to adopt or adapt to European hairstyles where hair became more straight and that was acceptable in the workplace especially and having straighter textures was a, was a way of fitting in and uh, we were able to because of the um, hot comb or the pressing comb which is actually a metal comb that is put on a uh, fire heated uh, area and then combed through the hair temporarily changes the nat natural uh, curly texture to a straight texture or by using a more permanent what, what is called as perms or relaxers to help hair of um, African hair to be straight for an extended period of time and then when the new growth comes in then that part also now has to be relaxed. But all of this really was done for convenience and for ease but also there was this subtle societal message um, that really connects to structural racism of fitting in and being acceptable and that having hair that is neat, clean, and is put together and, and not messy or as, as some, a very common term in the uh, vernacular of some uh, African uh, American or urban communities of having hair that is a hot mess. That is a very real um, concern and so there was a concern historically to, con to have hair that is neat and clean which again sweaty hair is the antithesis of that and so moving on to social influences we find that family uh, family influences young girls of color would hear this narrative from mothers or grandmothers or female relatives about fixing their hair having hair that is neat having hair that is not messy and so there is this concept, this idea of growing up and not messing up their hair. I recently had an experience. I was speaking at a high school, and I had a swim teacher come to me and say, uh, they call me Miss Patty or, or Dr. Patty, and they said, you have to speak to my girls in my gym class. This particular swim teacher, uh, he was white, and he said, my girls are not swimming. They're just not participating in gym. They're failing gym, and I don't know what to do. They don't want to swim. He really didn't understand this particular sociocultural construct of ideal hair, this standard of hair that is there in the minds of some girls that is the standard is my hair must be ideal, it must be neat. And they are hearing this from family members and from the, the messages from the culture and also the school environment as well through their peers. Um, I have spoken to parents that uh, have told me that they spent $150 on their child's hair and they are not about to have their child dis disturb it in gym. I've had, uh, I've spoken to students that have told me that they do not participate in gym because their mother uh, or their grandmother told them they cannot mess up their hair. I've spoken to girls that have told me on picture day they refuse to participate in gym. I've spoken to girls that have told me that they are doing summer school for gym because they did not participate during the school year. And so these are, are, are concerns that school nurses, um, educators, principals, and public health professionals should be aware of, that it's, this is not just about uh, candy corners, uh, candy stores on the corner, or food deserts, or an ubiquitous a number of uh, fast food restaurants in urban communities. This is a real concern that girls are feeling and these are reasons why they're not participating in physical activity. And so we need to be aware of these concerns because they're not easily observable 
and we need to create interventions, programs, policies, and clubs, after school clubs, or even just conversations so that we can communicate this to girls and help them to be active because we don't want this to affect health, future health outcomes. Um, I'm, I'm seeing another comment here. What I have found is as girls get older and leave high school, they change their ideal of hair and start wearing their hair naturally as opposed to relaxed. And this, this particular person is saying their daughter actually had that experience. Um, this, another one says their grandmother was a beautician and had her hair pressed regularly. Um, another one I see here, the question is, in what way does subscribing to a natural hair care regimen where styles may be more acceptable of, of moisture, moisture versus straight or processed hair care contribute to the differences in physical activity behavior? Well, this is, this is why I believe that this work is important, is that we do need to explore hairstyles and hair care regimen that would allow for women and girls of color to be physically active. We have to. We have to. Because this is, again, a population that is proportionally affected by overweight and obesity and an abundance of chronic disorders. And so we must be able to uh, come up with interventions to be able to uh, encourage and inspire and motivate this population. But also, natural hair care has become a pathway actually to healthy living. We have organizations like Black Girls Run and Girls on the Move and different organizations. Curls on the Move is an initiative that I'm, I've started as well to be able to motivate young girls to be active and teaching them ways of doing their hair. Uh, let's see. I see another quest comment here. Um, this is relevant in cultural or social health related factors. Speaking as a Dominican American Afro-Latina, cultural definition of beauty must be further evaluated and redefined. Absolutely. Thank you for that comment. That, um, again, it's not just for um, necessarily African American, which is why I actually prefer black or of African descent, because it really encompasses the African diaspora and also includes um, those that, like I said before, Afro-Latina community and also those that are biracial that there, are, there is this standard of ideal hair. Um, moving on to the school and work environment. What's acceptable in the cultural uh, practices of work? We know even from facial hair, we can look at beards. There was a time that having facial hair in the workplace was unacceptable. And now we find that it's acceptable to have a 5 o'clock shadow. It's acceptable now to come to school with a beard, with a mustache. There are products for grooming mustaches. There's conditioners for beards. And so I think as time moves on, we're finding that there are hair care practices. There are hair care maintenance and products. And we need to continue to move that science forward because this is really about obesity and having a, a, a healthy future at the end of the day. The neighborhood environment of, of many urban dwellers is also an area that can influence us regarding um, ideal hair. And there are many uh, beauty salons, hair care supply stores, beauty supply stores in the urban areas. And it has become almost ubiquitous, as ubiquitous as uh, candy stores or corner stores. You walk into an urban center, you find beauty supply stores. You find hair supply stores. They're selling straight hair. My concern, though, is um, the number of actual ads and marketing to young girls in, those, in the neighborhood environments that are seeing images of straight hair. And so that is a concern, because if they are continually receiving this message, my hair must be straight, my hair must be a certain way, that, and that certain way, that ideal hair, is preventing them from being physically active, then we must create another message. Because this is about our health outcomes and really teaching the next generation that there are options. There are options that, that, that they can still maintain their hairstyle and be physically active. And lastly, we do have media influences. Now, we know that the media, social media in particular, is synonymous with adolescence. It is. 
And so they are influenced by what they see. There are award shows, there are um, reality shows, there are movies. We have celebrities that have a certain type of hair style. And of course, young people, they want to emulate their, their role models. These are role models to them. And so we have a situation where this is an influence on girls, particularly. And uh, whether they're movies or musicians or celebrities, this is also contributing to their sociocultural um, construct of ideal hair. Enter uh, black hair. And so there are many ways uh, that hair can be shaped, colored, designed in, in black hair that basically there's, with the right products and instruments and tools, black hair can look any way and be any color. And again, this is an opportunity for young girls to see that, okay, this is, this is something that I can become. However, in many cases, young girls are not aware of the social capital, the financial resources that celebrities have access to, and they may not have that. And so this is a concern. I'm seeing a comment here. Um, this, this research is centered on girls, absolutely, but also for women as well. Um, this seems like a cultural shift is needed where physicality becomes the in versus the long weave, et cetera. We must believe that we can do both, be healthy and be neat. Absolutely. Thank you for that comment. We have to believe that. We can be healthy and have hair that is ideal. We have to redefine, and, and, and everyone needs to be a part of that conversation. You know, it's very interesting. We have a society that has a standard for beauty, and it is thin, and it is straight. However, it, the, there is a cultural shift that all shapes and all sizes uh, are now becoming more acceptable. And there's even a body positive movement campaign that I'm actually a part of that campaign with my Thick Girls Move movement that it, it's becoming more acceptable. But it will take everyone's involvement and, and everyone to see that. And I think that my, my goal is for that to be true too of, of hair, that it will it is possible to have hair that is neat and ideal, but also to be healthy and to have to be physically fit. Social influences, I share as I shared before, cultural and familial influences. Now here we have an image of a young girl who was getting her hair relaxed. And so I wanted to have this image because I know that um, there are several of you that are listening in that will hear this webinar and may not know what's involved with the process of straightening black hair. And so this is a actually chemical, chemicals that are used to straighten hair. And as the new growth, that's fresh new hair that is grown, as it comes on, then uh, what happens is you have to go back again and have the new growth then also straightened. And so this actually changes textured hair to a straight textured hair. And the, the challenge is, however, that water, in all of its forms, including sweat and perspiration, can change the texture of straight hair to the natural wavy, curly, kinky hair. And so, again, this is an area that is a narrative that, that many um, young women of color sometimes can hear from their family, their female relatives, that your hair must be straight, you must straighten your hair, do not participate in gym, do not sweat out your hair, do not mess up your hair. These are hidden images, uh, hidden uh, messages. And so uh, it is a concern that I think educators should be aware of. I have a comment here, a lot of African American women, are they wear weaves over their natural hair as a protective style and some wear it to fit in with society. Absolutely. So let's define what is a protective style. A protective style, these are terms you can find on the internet. A protective style is a style that protects hair, black hair, um, in a way of helping it to grow and to stay moist. As we shared before, biologically, there is a difference due to the follicles of different types of hair. And so in many cases, the follicle shape uh, does not allow for an even distribution of um, sebum. And so in that way, we're unable to keep, continue to maintain hair that is moist. And so that is a concern. Environmental factors, neighborhood influences, and what is the effect 
of, of young girls that are exposed to this type of marketing, regardless of whatever your hair texture is, I think there, there is a push in society for, um, for us to be concerned about this in terms of um, food marketing, in terms of body image. We are very concerned and I think one of the areas that I'm interested in in my research is exploring the effect of marketing, social marketing, to young girls that are walking past stores every day on their way to school, on their way home, and seeing images of straight hair. How does that shape their decision to be physically active? What can be done to help girls to see you can do both as, as a comment here? Media influences, uh, we have celebrities, movies, uh, music, um, everyone wants to look like Beyonce, many uh, young people, and my work as an educator, I talk to girls all the time and I ask them, who do you, uh, what's your, who's your role model? They want to have that hair, they want to look like Kim Kardashian, they want to look like Rihanna. And again, they're not aware of the abundance of resources that these celebrities have and what they are able to attain. And so this is, this is a concern because we have young people that are not aware of the resources but yet want to be this way and um, if this, which is fine, however, if it prevents them or impedes their decision to be physically active, that is, that is a concern. And, and also as a, a comment here, this is especially a concern in light of families that may not have the resources. In, in many urban communities, some may have to make decisions. Are we going to get our hair done this week or are we going to have food on the table? Are we going to pay the light bill or are we going to do our hair? And so this is a concern. As I shared before, I've had parents tell me there's no way their child is going to mess up their hair. They spent eight hours in the hair salon and they are going to school with that hairstyle and they refuse for their child to participate in physical activity. And we have to figure out a way around that historical influences, societal standards, as I said, that bar that is high. Um, this is actually referring to an, an article that was uh, published this year in the New York Times. It's actually only up until 2015 that the U.S. Army was able to allow, uh, made the decision to allow hair of all types um, regarding specifically um, African American, women of African descent, to have different types of hairstyles in the U.S. Army. Up until 2015, they changed their, their um, decision on that. And it was only this year that the U.S. Army was able to start allowing locks, or also what is known as dreadlocks or locked hairstyles, which is the one here on the left. Um, and of course, it has to be neat, and there's a standard to the U.S. Army, but some really see this as structural racism or actually fitting in and having to have your hair a certain way in order to be accepted. This is actually an image describing what some girls face when they are in the hair salon. Um, all you have to do is walk down the street in a urban community and or, or not, or maybe in the mall, and you will see this image of young people, older women sitting in the salon for hours and to get their hair done and deciding, will I, what will I do or what should I not refrain from? That this is again going back to the research, the data that I shared in the earlier slides, that some women, they, they see their, their exercise to really determine, the decision to exercise is determined by their hairstyle. Depending on their hair, they, it will impede their decision to be physically active. And because peers, especially during the stage of adolescence, is such an important part of a adolescent's um, life, depending on how their their peers' hair looks like will also shape their decision. And so I think speaking to educators, we need to continue to have dialogue, especially particularly in health education class. I've had um, conversations with principals and health educators, um, school district leaders about perhaps finding a way to include hair health in health education class, maybe a unit or a module. And um, really starting the conversation um, and helping young girls to see that, as, as the commenter said before, you can do both. Oh, I have someone here that's commenting. It says, very true, Patty. When I went to Army basic training in 1996, I had to take out my box braids that I had just put in in preparation for basic training. And so again, this is just coming from a comment 
um, that this is true in the U.S. Army, you spend hours. It can be eight to ten hours putting in braids um, for the convenience. And, and actually, it's, it's, some see this as a penalty because this is just the way hair grows out of the head. It would be similar to say, well, if your hair is grown out straight, you have to change that to be accepted. And that might be the case if you are deciding to, to become a part of the, the Army. But I think even in the workplace, and it's, again, it's a question of acceptability. And that's another argument for another day. But if it affects your decision to be physically active, and if it's for a population that is already disproportionately affected by overweight and obesity, it's something that needs to be addressed. And so there are many shades and colors and styles that can be utilized for young girls um, to be physically active. And these are a few. Rocks braids, um, protective hairstyles, even wigs or weaves to be able to um, protect hair from sweat, from the lack of oil, the lack of moisture, the dryness that can, that can uh, accompany physical activity. And there are ways around it. There are several products, homemade recipes. Um, but I think the biggest part of it is education and helping uh, young girls and women of color to see that there are options. We have to continue to put our health first. So what are we going to do as we wrap up the webinar? What are we going to do with all of this information? Um, the bottom line is sweat affects hair care, and it, and it impedes physical activity for some women of color. And um, what can be done? Interventions, policies, and programs can, can be created and developed and built upon. And again, we share the different societal constructs and influential factors, historical, social, familial, cultural, um, that are affecting hair and health outcomes. And, and again, I want to share, this can also be even a, a conversation that can continue on to skin care as well. But I think if there's an area that, um, of our lives socially that can affect our, our health outcome, this is a concern. So the, for providers, school nurses and health educators, one of the implications is really recognizing that cultural hair practices are important to this population. Um, for women and adolescent girls, and specifically for school nurses, thinking of how can I contribute to the conversation. Um, it's important to understand and appreciate the biological differences in hair and, and hair hygiene and also hair practices. And also to engage adolescents and women in, in conversations and discussions about hair type and hair practices, and that this is a, a global conversation. Anyone can contribute to this conversation. And I think it's really, it's really critical because we talk a lot about childhood obesity in our country, but I don't think we spend enough time really looking at the different populations that are actually affected. I created and developed curriculum for young people. I've taught classes. I had my own studio for fitness studio for all ages and all age groups. But when I took, a, took time to look at the data, what I found was that young girls of color are actually having higher rates of obesity and overweight. And that's why I, I chose to focus in on this population. But I think as, as health educators and nurses, we can continue the conversation through a unit, perhaps a module during school time, creating clubs, after school clubs. Those of you that are leading um, Girl Scouts or home homeschooling your children or leading community church-related after-school clubs, consider a hair hygiene program. Consider talking to girls about being involved and in being physically active. And I think as, as parents, being an example, starting a walking group, that's a great way to enter the world of physical activity. Um, and it doesn't allow your hair so much sweating. Local health departments, if you are at the local health department, some implications would consider funding initiatives and programming that address this sociocultural barrier to physical activity, particularly in communities where there are, are young girls that are overweight and obese. Um, developing an RFP for community organizations, uh, especially for those that are girl-centric community-based organizations. There are different grants out there, and, and I've seen that usually it's the same organization that receives these funding. But what about creating an opportunity for the small group 
of women, of, of, of older women that are just having conversations with young girls. This is an area. And of course, involving dance, which is something that everyone of all age groups can take part in. And lastly, for public health professionals and policymakers, implications is figuring out how to turn what you've learned here in the webinar into workplace uh, professional development workshops and really sharing this with local school districts, developing after school programs, and how to continue the conversation in health education class. Um, consider policymakers maybe choosing classes such as yoga or uh, Pilates or strength training classes or uh, credit for gym class, perhaps allowing students to choose the time of day that gym is offered, and again, funding and developing walking groups to be able to reach this population. Um, let's see. Right now, that brings us to the end of our webinar, although I know that uh, it says it's fine if we have to go over time if needed. Uh, I have a comment here that says, um, it, this is key socializing our girls to want to be physical and to choose to participate in something that's active and fun is, is critical. Any questions before we close? Just feel free to type it in in the chat box. There's one question regarding care and mean girl attitudes. This is a great, okay, so we have a question on how to address hair and mean girl attitudes. Again, this is an area of, I believe, uh, self-esteem and um, really developing through conversation and creative programming. And this is where uh, girl-centric groups, there are, I know of many uh, leaders of girl, girls clubs that are working hard. They may not be as well known as some of the larger groups, but there are many groups um, in urban centers that are uh, girl-centered groups and really teaching girls about self-esteem and it's not about what people uh, refer to you, but it's who you know you are inside. And so I think self-esteem is, is a big area for this. Okay, um, my contact information is here on the screen, and I want to thank um, the Rutgers School of Public Health for this, for this opportunity. Thank you so much, and thank you for listening.